<laughs> okay, so my title for our talk today is Pigs, Pearls and Prayer. Now I've used the alliteration and there's three things there. Um, Matthew, I have found, is uh, concerned with threes. He loves threes. Maybe it's because of his uh, tax collector status and he's got an accountancy or something background, but we'll see that as we go along. So read with me chapter 7, and I'm going to read from verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample you. They may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And I was reading from the NIV. My introduction... Oh, yeah, sorry, I didn't even have our... Yeah. Um, Matthew has a big thing about numbers. Now, we are starting today from verse 6. You'll see it up there. And as, as I was reading, I don't know if you noticed, but it seemed like it was really jumping around quite a lot. Like, verse 6 just jumps out. think it belongs with the rest of the chapter and the other half think that it's out there on its own. Mathematics is not a strong suit among theologians. Half plus and half plus and half. Okay, um, ma- mathematics though is a strong suit of the disciple Matthew who chose very carefully when compiling the sermon to speak in threes. Um, And I just make my, if I make my call, I put myself in the third category of those who think that the the, the pigs and dogs are on the other. But Matthew, I'm sure, intended it to be with the don'ts that go with verses, from verses one to five. And so I think that he counterpoints, you can see them, can you see them there highlighted in yellow? Do not judge, do not give, do not throw in the screen behind me. And then he's highlighting positive things that are written in red. Ask, seek and knock. Matthew is revealing his love of the number three even as he reveals the gospel to us. Matthew was a tax collector, and so he knew all about numbers, but he delights, he allows himself to delight in the number three. Firstly, we had nine Beatitudes. Then we had two sets of three saying, it was said, but I say. Jared took us through three religious instructions about fasting, 
<coughs> praying and giving, nine Beatitudes and nine instructions. Now, especially if you are new to the Bible, you might not understand that Matthew the disciple was Matthew, a tax collector. He profited at the expense of the Jewish community. And as Matthew records the sermon, you can see his experiences play out in chapter 6, verses 19 to 24. And he concludes, that as, as Jesus concludes, you cannot serve both God and money. He draws our attention to riches in 619 and how the love of riches, riches is like a darkness. Matthew loved storing treasures on earth. Matthew knew what he was talking about as a tax collector. Money was where his heart was. It's almost like... speck in your eye but let me tell you it was a plank in my eye and that was the message that we heard from Ross Brown a few weeks ago about judgment about specks and about logs now with all those threes you won't be surprised three points ask seek and knock but what is surprising about these three do's when the sermon has been clearly given don'ts is that these positives have very little um, have very little uh, things that restrict them in fact it's it's a real freedom that we have but we need to deal with the the don'ts from our from our passage in verse six so let's do that now Jesus uses three very graphical pictures and I drew upon ones that I saw. dogs tearing up that little holy piece of paper. So let's just say a few words about that and their application. Jesus gives us two memorable pairs to work with. There is a Jewish way of pairing that you see that the first is matched with the last and the middle goes together. So the first pair is actually the first and the last line. Don't give dogs what is sacred, or they will turn and tear you to pieces. The second, pour, the second pair, in Jewish thought, is the important pair. It's the centre thought. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet. The Bible uses picture concepts. Uh, sorry, the Bible uses words as picture concepts. Now, if you've only been a Christian for a little while, you might look upon these animals, pigs and dogs, as a the sea. But they are all more than that in the picture book of the Old and New Testament. A dog was a term of inferiority used by the Jews to describe the Gentiles. Not to describe a dog as a little beagle pup, <clears throat> or as the, you know, we had beagles, but as a wild, unpredictable carnivore. Jews were known as being the set-apart ones, the holy ones, they were to be holy because God had especially selected them to be separate. And so the Jews became used to this language of holiness. The temple grounds <clears throat> were full of everyday things, of cups, of bowls to wash in. But they were special because they were set apart just for one purpose – 
and that is that they were there so that the, the Jews could worship God in an acceptable way. That water container was made the same way, maybe with more care, but it was made in the same way as normal washing implements. But that what made it special was the purpose that it was set aside for. And just like that, the Jews believed that they were like other people, in fact, the least of all the nations, but they were special because God set them apart. It was So these objects were special because of their worship of their God, who also was unique. The Gentiles didn't understand this holiness. When Babylon came in 586 BC and took Judah into captivity, they stole the gold and silver articles of worship and they were used by the king just for his normal drinking and eating. So those things that were sacred became desecrated. To this day, our society struggles with the idea of being sacred. Sunday used to be considered sacred. No football, no work, no retail open. But now you could say that Sunday has been desacretized. It's been desecrated. It is no longer sacred to our society. In the book, The Righteous Mind, Jonathan Haidt reminds describes how he went, to Israel, he went to India and saw their amazing attitude towards the sacred. He couldn't understand it at first. Why, in the midst of all this dirtiness, would certain things be regarded as sacred? But after a few years of being there, he got into the rhythm of this sacredness and he started to regard those things in the same way that the Indians did. And likewise, he saw that in America, there'd been where his home was, that there had been this desacredizing, this desecrating of what had been considered sacred. That particularly among the progressive, that fewer and fewer things were considered to be sacred. So Jesus was saying that the Jews weren't to try to get the Gentiles to try to understand about these sacred things. They knew that he was speaking about important things, but Jesus hadn't yet died and rose again. The Holy Spirit hadn't yet been given. So what Jesus was saying was that it wasn't yet time for the lovely message of the gospel, the pearl, right, from our second pair, that they weren't ready to hear that. We see the expression, um, the other expression that I saw play out was um, in the New Testament when Jesus was talking to the Syrophoenician woman and she was a Gentile and when she asked Jesus for help, he picks up on this gap between the two cultures and the way that it was perceived when he speaks in a metaphor and he says, it isn't right to take what is for the children and toss it to the dogs. It is a picture that she understood well as a Gentile living close to the Jews. But she accepted the challenge of faith and she asks anyway. And Jesus gives her what she wants. In some ways, she's a beautiful picture of this asking that we're permitted to give to God. Jesus delighted in teaching the Jews from the example of the others. He did it in parables with the parable of the Good Samaritan. He did it in the meeting with this Gentile lady or the lady uh, by the by um, the lady in by the well, the woman at the well. He delights in the refugee, he delights in the outsider, he delights in the blind and the deaf, those who aren't permitted because of purity laws to go to the temple. And so they flock to him. And our closing song will celebrate that. Now, the second pair, the pigs and the pearls, that is another holy desecra- and versus desecrated symbol. 
But, and I'm just going to summarize here. The Romans had many gods, right? The local Romans. They were needy, they were local, and they were unpredictable. But you, were, you would be able to bribe them because they were needy. And they, in return, would, would give you victory in battle or they would give you a child, whatever the, the god was, was there for. But you had to leave them for other gods when you left town. But this Jewish god, Yahweh, he had no needs. He was universal and he revealed himself to the prophets. <clears throat> But above all, the scripture indicates that he is holy, he is perfect, and he is pure. He's not like a big version of an earthly king, like you might think of as Zeus. And so here's the question. How do you live in the light of a perfect God? And the answer is very carefully. The book of Leviticus, while being, for most people, one of the most boring books to read, sets this idea of these rings of purity starting at the most holy place where God dwelt above the ark at the mercy seat and then going out until we get right to the outer courtyard and each time there are fewer and fewer people allowed in that area because God is holy and the people are unholy. And so this careful, this careful cultivation of rings were the reason that pigs were considered to be unclean. You couldn't eat them and hence they were only Gentile food. So pigs were yet another example, a picture, if you like, a word picture of Gentiles. And the pearl, excuse me, I'm getting a pop there. The good news of Jesus to save the world was the pearl. If you would like to, you can write in your margin, uh, Matthew 13, 45 and 46. Jesus was simply saying, that God at the moment is only telling this good news to the Jews. It will go wider because that is always God's purpose, but not yet. Now, I've probably said all, all much too ready, uh, much, much too much about this already, but the speck and the logs uh, and the pigs and the pearls are actually well-known metaphors even in our language to this day. So I think that they are very memorable. But let's move on to our, our three, our three uh, topics that we're going to cover about prayer. So let's, um, let me turn to it and let's read those three, let's, let's read those uh, four or five verses together. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will, be, and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And you can see that I've separated those, those requests and you can see that they're in two groups of three, yellow, green, blue, then yellow, green, blue. Matthew is still very attached to his threes and he gives us two sets of three there to consider. Prayer as A-S-K, so that is quite, um, in the Greek it's A-Z-K, but um, it's lovely that as prayer, as asking, um, there were songs about it I used to sing when I was a kid, asking, keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Who's ever sung that song? Not, not so many. Russell, you haven't sung it? No. 
<laughs> you don't you don't know it, Graham? Oh, okay, sure. I wanted to make three points about the asking. Um, first of all, we ask because we ask God because we're in relation to Him. We seek because we are away from our true home. And we knock because God has shown his hospitality to us as a host. First of all, asking because we are in relationship. We already know from the Lord's Prayer that Jared covered a few weeks ago that we are to ask for our daily needs. We have permission to ask, and we ask because God loves to give. It's noticeable here that Jesus is teaching, perhaps for the the first time, about God, not as a distant, holy God, but as a close, holy Father. Now that is something to be in awe about. God isn't someone that we can be flippant about. The movement, uh, the church movement, called the, sometimes called the prosperity movement, teaches us that God can be manipulated into making us well off, giving us what we want. No wonder Matthew, the tax collector, warns us off about that. He knew what it was like to have uh, money as a God. You can't use God to worship your real God, money. Some people talk about religious giving even, um, the, way that we, the way that we give, as a way of twisting God's arm to give us what we want. But it isn't like that at all. That isn't a relationship. That's God as a business associate or a personal, um, a personal assistant. But sadly, some people do think of their relationship with God as transactional. But it isn't. It's a relationship. That's why Jesus warns us earlier in chapter 6, never think of your relationship with God as a way of somehow making it big in the world. What it is about is relationship. When Jesus was confronted by the rich young man, Jesus presented, challenged him to put his riches second to his relationship with Jesus. And the passage says it all. He went away sad because he had great wealth. But it also isn't about doing great things so that Jesus will reward us as a payment. We have that dreaded story of the people that tell Jesus, didn't we do great works in your name? But Jesus responds, away from me, I never knew you. Jesus is proclaiming a new family relationship. He is our brother and God is our father. You can see that relationship in verses 9, 10 and 11. Talking about sons and fathers and children. With the clear implication that we are now in God's family. Because we are in a family, we can just ask. Just as Everly or Bowden can ask Jimmy or Jana. Just as Jared or Leighton can ask me or Jenny. Just as Kara can ask Tim or Carolyn, so also we can request of God. And we are free to do so. You can see here also now about the reasons for Jared's talk about our religious life. Fasting is not about our relationship with others here. It is about our relationship with God. We do it to show our devotion to him, not for the approval of men, women, or those who can see, and not because it must be done so that God will then answer. Secondly, we seek because we are away from home. If we are to be found, if we are to seek, we must find God. Or if we are lost, we must be found by him. And the Bible uses those terms interchangeably. It's so noticeable about this talk of of God as a father. And we have that parable of the lost son where 
he delights that the son who was lost comes back and is found and that rejoicing respond and that rejoicing responds and a banquet excuse me i've just backed up because because it's a relationship we we can seek and just like we have ask seek knock the seeking is the thing that has already been said seek you first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you seeking is truly the heart of of, of how we are going to have a restored relationship with god we do it to show devotion to him not for the approval of others we seek him just as he has sought us but thirdly we knock and the picture is there is as a door knocking at the door we knock because god shows his hospitality of host, as a host so just imagine that we seek and we come and we see god just like that returning to the uh, in John uh, in Luke chapter 15 when the son he's lost in the far country he comes of course the father comes out in that case but he goes up to the door and he knocks we do that because for God we come to him as his guest we stay as his sons and daughters and as it says in Psalm 23 verse 5 you you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies my cup overflows god responds with overflowing generosity god is most hospitable as a host and while we might come in to him without a relationship he accepts us he adopts us and we become his sons and daughters and so we can knock we can be invited into god's hospitality this is so important because we can come to him even when we feel like things aren't going well the truth is that very often we feel like maybe i shouldn't come maybe i don't feel worthy of coming of knocking at the door and that is indeed one of the ways in which this greater righteousness is different to the Pharisees who thought that you had to be right before God before you can come to him. But rather, God delights in taking the broken and accepting them. And indeed, that was the story of Genesis, uh, of Jesus' ministry. It so reminds me of that passage from Revelation 3, where God is standing at the door and knocking. Um, and so we are, we are being sought by God and we seek him. So a couple of con- conclusion, concluding thoughts. And they're visual. Um, um, I'm quite indebted to um, Sky Jathani, the author who wrote a book called what if Jesus was serious about the Sermon on the Mount? So some of these illustrations come from him. You can see there is no barrier. Jesus is right here. You can see the, the way that the religious world thinks about meeting with God. There's an entrance toll. There's a gate that must be raised. And then I can't see that. I can't quite see that. What does it say? There's a little supply, a, a little place that you can buy your... Thanks. Supplies for the journey. And uh, <clears throat> now, it, it's, the idea is that, that, you know, when we get to the top, then we can ask the questions. And I just loved how um, Tom Wright, in his commentary, Matthew for Everyone, just a bit of an everyday commentary, he, he says this. He says, for most of us, the problem in prayer is that we're not that we're eager to ask for the wrong things the problem is that we are not nearly eager enough to ask for the right things 
No, I need to be a person who the first thing that they do will go to prayer, not to climb the mountain first, but rather to come to God as him wanting to be, um, wanting to know what we feel and what we need for our, for our daily needs. Secondly, prayer is powerful and especially God's power is powerful in our weakness. Another, you can see there, you've got your prayer and you've got your, your divine circuit breaker. So we can give our requests to God. And if he knows that that will be damaging, he will click that circuit breaker and he will say no. And, and again, according to Tom Wright, and I love this, the idea of prayer he likened to the idea of God as an artist working with difficult material. And prayer is the way that some of that material cooperates with the artist instead of resisting him. You know, the picture I thought of was of paint. You know, when paint, you can put on paint with a brush and it can be very thick. But if you're going to put on uh, paint with a spray gun, it's got to be mixed with water. It's got to get to the right consistency before it can flow correctly. You know, well, I think in that picture, prayer is like the water that enables him to work with us. As we pray with him, we become malleable in his hands and he becomes the master artist. Yes, the potter and the clay, they need the water to to be able to, you know, once it's dried, yeah. You're on your ground. Have you got a wheel? Have you done that before? Yeah, I know mums. Have you, have you still got your wheel, mum? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, and the reason that they're so powerful, those, these word pictures, is because that they're things that, that we can understand. But part of it is that we understand that we're clay. We understand that we're difficult. Um, we don't have to read that in the Bible, we know, because of our own hearts. But prayer is God's power in the midst of our weakness. Thirdly, God's power is also a power to say no, as I, as I heard before. And here I got a quote from C.S. Lewis in Work and Prayer. And um, that's really um that's really small for me <laughs> it says prayers are not always granted this is not because prayer is a weaker kind of causality but because it is a stronger kind when it works at all it works unlimited by space and time that is why god has retained the discretionary power of granting or refusing it except on the condition that prayer would destroy us. The one that I'm thinking of there is where it works so powerfully was, was Elijah, where he prayed that it would not rain, and it didn't. When he prayed that God would, that God would honour that sacrifice and send fire. And so those things are not bound by causality because God himself is the one who brings things to being. There was another, there was another um, uh, slide that, there was an, another quote that I had that uh, ended up on the cutting room floor, but it was from a bishop. And he says, the funny thing is, when I pray, all these coincidences happen. But when I stop praying, the coincidences also stop. And that's been a, a thing that we've, we've come to a few times, isn't it, over the past couple of weeks as we've been thinking about our relationship with God. Finally, prayer's power to transform us from within. That is truly the good news. It isn't enough for us to be able to look outwards and to change the world. Prayer works on us to change us. And this quote from Richard Raw, who is a... a um, uh, in some ways, he's a Catholic priest and he writes some things that are quite controversial but this I don't think is controversial in the slightest and it's how we must be transformed. Here it goes. 
Christians are usually sincere and well-intentioned people until you get to any real issues of ego, control, power, money, pleasure and security. All the things that we've been talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. They tend, then they tend to be pretty much like everybody else. We often give a bogus version of the gospel, the good news, like a fast food religion without any deep transformation of the self. And the result has been the spiritual disaster of Christian countries that tend to be consumer-oriented, proud, warlike, racist, class-conscious and addictive as everybody else and often more so, I'm afraid. There are many ways in which prayer can unlock God's power in the world, but how much we need God's prayer to unlock (laughs) unlock transformation in in our own heart and life. Let me just tell a little story. I... um. I was out walking a couple of weeks ago uh, doing my bird thing and because it was a day that might have been sunny, might have been, might have been overcast, I had two pairs of glasses. I had my sunglasses on and then I had another pair of glasses that were just sitting there like that. And these, it was actually these pair of glasses, brand new, like just bought them over $500. And I was going along fine and dandy. I set up, did my photos, um, didn't quite get the photos I wanted. And then I've gone, where's my glasses? I didn't know where they were. And I hadn't felt them or seen them for an hour. And I'd walked four kilometres. And I went, oh, no. I went, okay, Lord. This is a, a request. Can, I, can, you please, can you please show me where my glasses are? And remember, these glasses, they're anti-reflecting, right? So the sun doesn't shine off them and the little tiny arms and it was in, gla- in grass. So you can imagine how that's like a needle in a hay- haystack. Um, and yet, even though when I asked, um, I did feel a peace about it. And as you can tell, I've got them on now because I found them. And I found them because he answered me. And he answered me because I'm in relationship with him. And how much then does that inspire me to say, God, I not only want to transform my life because I need it, I want to do it because I'm your son and because you've been so gracious to me. May God transform our hearts and lives through this amazing privilege we have of prayer that our hearts will be changed from independent, which is what we our default condition, to being dependent upon him. Because if prayer does nothing else, it shows us that we are dependent upon him, as the quote from Richard um, so sadly reveals. May it be that we will be people of transformation, people of dependence upon God, that we will indeed be an image of Jesus himself in the world. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we've been talking about uh, things as, as, um, as different as yeah, pigs as, and pearls, and when we're reminded of of things of that um, graphical difference. We're reminded that ultimately that's the difference between you as a holy God and us as, as very, very unholy. And while during the speaking of the Sermon on the Mount, the Gentiles weren't included, we thank you, Lord, that because we celebrated uh, again that this feast where we where we partook of, your, of the, the bread as a symbol of your body and the wine as a, as a symbol of your blood, we've been introduced to a new table of fellowship, one in which we can truly be holy, set apart for you. 
And we just pray, Lord, that you'll make us people of your word, that you'll make us people of prayer, that we'll understand the privilege that we've been granted, that as we participate within the life of the war room, within the lives of our family, as we dedicate our lives to your service, that you will do then your part, transforming us from within, that we truly can, as Romans 12, 1 and 2 uh, encourages us, that we will live lives transformed for your service. And we commit ourselves to this path because you are such a gracious Father. Thank you for what you've done to us, for us, particularly in the life of Jesus. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came as that, as a humble example to us that we might be able to follow in your footsteps. Thank you. Amen.